What was the relationship like with your dad? This podcast, Military Veteran Dad, is brought to you by the Business of Fatherhood, an effort by me to help you become a better dad. By helping dads create a lasting feeling of change on the inside, help them grow through generational trauma, and by redefining the definition of living. There is more to life than being alive. To find out more information about this, head on over to bencloy.com or check out the Business of Fatherhood podcast on any and all platforms. Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome back, guys, to Military Veteran Dad. This is episode 163, and do I have a bad dad joke for you? Why did the pencil say it stink in here? Wait for it. Because it was a number two pencil. You're welcome. It's a really bad dad joke, and hopefully you are laughing in your car, and hopefully I brought a little bit of laughter into your life to make you think like, you know what? If I can laugh at that joke, anything is possible today. Who we are talking to today is not just your average guest. She is an incredible woman with an incredible story and even a more incredible mission. Her name is Dr. Michelle Watson. Michelle Watson Canfield, PhD, LPC, is a national speaker, author, licensed professional counselor of 27 years and founder of The ABBA Project, a nine-month group forum for dads whose daughters are in their teens and 20s. She writes guest articles for all the major newspapers. She has blog posts on her website that those blog posts have really helped me out when she emails them out as well. She's got best-selling books. Dad, here's what I really need to know from you, a guide for connecting with your daughter's heart. It's followed by her most recent field guide for men. Let's talk conversation starters for dads and daughters. This conversation is personal and mind-blowing because I bring in my issues, I bring in my questions, and we dive into them. And they are so timely a point for where we are at in our journey as dads. And I believe the questions are some of the same questions that you might be asking or maybe not understanding what question to ask. So I'm positive this is going to help you. And two, the feedback that she gives and the way she sets up the tools actually inspired me to be a better podcast guest because what she does is articulates a question gives you an answer, but doesn't just give you an answer that maybe applies in 2% of situations. She gives you a toolbox that essentially helps you work through the entire area and getting a full kind of survey of what's really going on in her heart. And so today's episode with Dr. Michelle Watson, mind blowing, mind bending, and hopefully life altering. I haven't said those words for an interview, but this episode deserves every one of those. And so like tradition follows, I'll be back on the other side to share my big takeaway. But let's get started with our interview with Dr. Michelle Watson. Welcome to the podcast, Michelle. Great. Thanks for having me, Ben. I'm so excited to be here. I am excited, not just because of what you do, but because this is just close to my heart on what you do, because you help men essentially like you're like a dad whisper, but in a particular dialect <laughs> to their daughters. And my daughter, who's 10, I feel like is I'm also on this front lines of trying to figure out the same things that you were talking about. So we're going to help a bunch of dads, but we're also, I'm selfishly going to be helped here because I'm going to bring some of my own questions and get some of my own things that I'm trying to struggle with or that I am struggling with and get some insights. But Michelle is essentially that person that we've always wanted in our life to navigate what our daughters need and to help give you those simple little reframes that can help you get more connected. I love it. Yes, I'm, I'm so excited that we're talking about this very important topic, right, of how much dads matter to their daughters, whether or not your daughter can ever tell you that. I don't think a lot of women and daughters specifically even know how much their dad means to them, especially when they're young. So, dad, you've got to get out on the front end, just like you did on the front lines. When you've been in the military, you have that mindset. You know how important it is, right, to be out in front of 
let's say, quote unquote, the enemy. And I'm like, there's a lot of things in this culture that are competing to fight against your daughter's self-esteem, her self-identity, her confidence. But as a dad, that same military mindset, get out in front, which means you've got to know about what's attacking her, what's both inside her mind, inside her body and outside. And hopefully today, by the end, dads will have a few more tools in their fathering toolbox to be a better dad than they are you know, or were yesterday or are today going forward for tomorrow. So I'm going to tee you up with a, a pun, but I'm also going to ask a question. That, so I am wondering, which is one of your favorite questions. <laughs> yes. The moment in your practice where you realized this superpower or this probably was like the elephant in the room that now has become your life work. Like, what was that moment like when you realized that this is actually what I need to talk about? You know, it's funny you ask it that way, because maybe this is a Mars Venus thing, right? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Like, I would love it if I had one defining moment where I went, aha, this is what matters. But, but I think for me, it was probably more of a process and more than a, you know, than one event of year after year after year, session after session. I mean, I'm now 27 years in private practice as a clinician sitting there with primarily women. I also work with men, walk alongside men, but really that collective um, experience of where I realized that so often I was, you know, seeing tears stream down a daughter's face saying, I hate it when my dad is disappointed in me. I'm used to his anger. I don't like that either, but it hurts me too much to know he's disappointed. And that's why I don't tell him things. And then having adult women who are, you know, even with fathers who are deceased, still stuck in places where their dad missed their heart and their dad can't do anything about it now. And it, it kind of, I would say, accumulated Ben for me, where all of a sudden it was like, this is really a consistent theme I'm hearing. And so I, I, I traveled again, I say from my planet of Venus, where I speak Venusian to, to your planet of Mars. And you talked about kind of that bilingual thing that I have now. I say, I speak Martian and Venusian, and hopefully men today will know that I'm championing them. I'm not here to beat you up, to put you down, to tear you down. I'm here to champion you as a dad. And I'm going to give you some tools for your fathering toolbox where you don't have to give away your source. You get full credit. That's why I'm whispering in the background. I once been had a, a guy actually say to me, we do not like women shouting at us. And I don't know how you do it, but somehow you whisper and help us be a hero. And I'm like, you got it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> there was a moment that you just talked about where there's this idea that we are this common thing. And I think it it's almost as I done this dad work, it's, it's almost like if, if fathering was was mathematics, fathering is like pi. It's always 3.14. And it's almost the variable that makes mathematics work from a geometric point of view. Without it, the whole thing collapses. And I often feel like what society really needs is this pi to come back into mathematics but in fathering. Because Meg Meeker talks about it. You talk about it. It's this common thread. And I would almost boil it down to something that I kind of always preach is the voice of a father in someone's life is that one voice that always needs to be the first voice, especially for your daughter. And even for my kids, like I've had this, like, um, especially the bus, the bus is like where the front lines of like early conversations can happen, where it's unregulated behind the bus driver and anything can happen. And you're like, is it good or bad that these conversations are happening? And I always kind of air back, like, I can't protect my kids from life, but right. I want my kids to have my voice be the first one. Yes, and I think that's what you re- probably have seen as well. Yes. She's going to replay your voice in your head for good or bad, positive or negative, right? Just like you, each of you have done with your dad, right? Their voices are in our head. And I love that you're saying be the first voice. And I say too, remember, you're her first love. You're the first man she ever loved or will love if you haven't yet had kids or, you know, you're thinking ahead, dad, absolutely. I love that concept that you just said, be the first. I actually wrote one of my blogs, my dad, daughter, Friday blogs one year, first week of January. And that's what hit me, be the first. And I listed all the ways that dad could be that first one to lay a foundation, right? Same. We're using lots of metaphors today, you and I, but think about even the house, right? The foundation has everything to do with the strength of the entire building. So dad, those first years are so vital. And maybe you're a dad who's estranged from your kids. 
I mean, I, I would say probably 75% of the emails I get are from dads who are estranged, got one just a couple of days ago due to divorce that right kills a dad's heart. And he's like, I can't be the first anymore. I'm almost the last to ever have input now or contact. And that's really a real place that dads live. How about just right, right out here from the gate, Ben, if I just give dads who are estranged, their hearts are broken. They feel like they're getting beat up, right? Maybe by an ex-wife, maybe by an ex-spouse. Um, if, if it was a girlfriend, let's say not even married, but dad, here's an idea, really practical. I want to put stuff on the lower shelf, like action oriented, like ABC is a fathering A is action C is consistency. B I've always said, be the man you want her to marry, like be that guy, right. That sets the bar high. But on this action front, dad, if you don't have contact with your daughter right now, for whatever reason, might be stuff you've done, might be stuff that's done against you where you're made up to be someone you're not. Go get a journal, like a hard copy physical journal, order it on Amazon. Some bookstores like Barnes and Noble are still open, right? Most of them are shut down, but you can go look at it in person. Buy a journal that you know that daughter would love. You might have two daughters. That one likes that look. That one likes the other look. And begin to date your entries in that journal. Tell her what you dream about for her, what memories you love thinking about when you pull up what she was like when she was two or three and put her grimy hands around your neck and kiss your face. Things that remind you of her wishes you have um, thoughts, you know, that you think, I wish I could tell you this today because this came to mind of something I think you would love. You could put prayers in there for her. You could put books you'd love her to read that you just read and thought she would love. Can you imagine, Ben, the power years later when there's a restored relationship where she's old enough to make a decision for herself to come back to you, to give her that hard copy journal that says, you were never far from my heart. You were never far from my thoughts. You were first even if you were being told something else. I mean, let me just ask you, Ben, what power do you, as a guy, what would you say as a military dad? What do you think impact that playbook would have or that that time capsule would have to a dad? I really should say to the dad and the daughter, really both of them. I would almost frame it that a lot of military dads join the military because of some generational trauma that we're running from. So either a destructive parent or mom or dad, and that even if it was just a dad giving it to a, per, a dad in the military, what I think what dads really miss, and this exercise of journaling would add to it, we don't even have a vocabulary to articulate the feelings of the heart. And especially in the military, we're told that the matters of the heart aren't things that you worry about either. And so the exercise in putting words to that in that journal and getting that passed down to you, vocabulary is something that the, there's a simple word, but I'm realizing more and more, it's the power of books, it's the power of podcasting. It's the power of when one of like you and I speak to emotion and then we've described something that this person has been trying to feel. Mm -hmm. Or as I just say that what this daughter is almost but maybe the similar question always happens, or I've heard it happen, where when a dad takes his own life, that there's a, the kids are haunted with this question, why didn't my dad love me enough to stay? Or mm -hmm. why didn't my dad love me enough to fight for me? Right. And to me, this book would nuke that thought in her story and would help her remove it and redefine it. And no matter what the relationship like in the future, no matter how long you are here on this earth, to me, that's a path to knowing your dad. And I always say like the worst case scenario as a dad is when your kids go to your funeral and they say, hear a story about your life from a friend and they realize for the first time, like, why didn't my dad tell me that? I would love to have known him. And if they can't yeah. know you, they can't live like you. They can't draw from your wisdom. And you're only forgotten when people no longer remember your name. And without stories like that and journals like that, you're just going to be a number in time and be insignificant. And if you want to be significant, you have to like share something that's worth remembering and your life is worth remembering. Exactly. And I think the other thing I want to highlight is that when you write something the old fashioned way, pen to paper, it, it's contrasted right from technology, which is really where everything is, is slanted right now. Right. So when you write in your own handwriting something about your life, that could be another thing to put in the journal. Hey, you know what? You know, it's fourth of July. I just thought I'd write in this journal that when I was a kid, this is one of my dad's stories. He grew up on the South side of Chicago 
And he was in gangs from the time he was 12 years old. Three different last names among the seven kids. The last time he saw his dad at his house was his dad was drunk, had worked for the railroad, lived in boxcars, homeless. And his mom put an iron on his dad's face. That was the last time he saw his dad except for a couple times when he was in downtown Chicago, he and his brother were on a bus and his dad was drunk in the back going, those are my kids, you know, and they were so embarrassed. And, you know, my dad only went into the military, by the way, into the army because his grandfather had been in the army. And so with no role model from his dad of what to do with his life, his grandfather was his role model. And maybe you're a grandfather listening that will be encouraged by that story is that you're setting the pace. Even if you have a son or maybe a daughter who isn't able to be a parent and you've had to step in, look at my dad went into the military, learned discipline, right? Learned how to, my dad was already a hard worker, but back to 4th of July, when he was a kid, he used to buy like 300, I don't, he says $300. I'm thinking, dad, I think you're He's 84 now. Like maybe your memory's warped because that seems like an insane amount of money for a kid back then. But he said, I would, I think what he said is I would buy fireworks for $50 and sell them and make 300 by the time I sold them to everybody. Like he was a wheeler and dealer as a kid. He already, I, can you hear the joy in my voice? Like, I love that story about my dad, but maybe in the journal, you can write things for that time of year. Like, hey, here's a Christmas tradition that we had when I was a kid. Or here's something I I don't know that I've ever told you. You know what? I'm going to say one more thing about this writing, which is kind of fun that you and I landed on this topic, kind of going into more detail than I thought we would. That's what I love about these conversations. They go where they go, you know, with no plan always, or a plan or an agenda, but then they end up different. Which, Correct. Hello, I have an yeah, entire page of oh, notes here that we are way off topic, but we're right, right so on topic. Is, right. So this is how your life with your daughter will be. You go where the right where the train goes. But my dad, we're goodwill people. We love getting a bargain. And my dad found a bunch of books brand new called Your Story Matters, I think, or Your Dad's Story or something. I think it's maybe Your Dad's Story, where it asks a prompt question. The book is like a journal. And my dad... Recently, I just moved from Oregon to Arkansas five months ago. My dad gave me this book that he had been writing in. And he actually goes, I got tired about two thirds of the way through it. Kept asking me the same questions. But my dad drew pictures of like his first car and it opened, a, you know, where the door handles were in the center instead of the outside. And he drew it out for me. But I, I'm telling you, dad. Maybe that's your takeaway today, because, again, it's about action. You didn't love a hero that didn't take action. You know, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, whatever. And so, Dad, an action step would be writing in a book. But you know what, Ben? We got to make this more practical, because some men are like, I ain't going to ever do that. I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I'm not a writer. I don't like my handwriting. Nobody can read it. I don't blah, 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 right? Maybe what you could do is go get a pad of sticky notes today. You probably already have them in your house or a dry erase marker, write sticky notes of affirmation, love to your daughter and put it on either her bedroom mirror, her bathroom mirror, the rear view mirror of her car. And if you don't live in the same house as your daughter, write even in dry erase marker or sticky note with a note on her mirror, or on your mirror, take a picture of it. And send it to her. I had a dad give me that idea. He goes, hey, I got an away game too. When I'm out on the road, I'm in a hotel. I do it there and send it to her in real time. I'm like, okay, Tim, that rocks. I'm going to quote you. Dads have great ideas, but maybe that could be a way you could write out your love for your daughter because the mirror dad for us as women is deadly. We see every flaw and you as men are like, what are you talking about? You're beautiful. Well, do you tell her that? A study was done a number of years ago by Dove Soap. They found 2% of women is all believe they're beautiful or see themselves as beautiful. Dad, you've got to tell her the beauty you see. Why not write it out? Because I've seen girls that save these sticky notes for months on their mirror. And even I have one dad, she moved it from the bathroom to her bedroom right by her light switch so she could see it walking out the door because her dad said it. So maybe that, would that be a a way that we could say dads at least do that kind of writing? 
I like that. And I also do it in the lunch boxes because I'm the one that makes the lunches. So I always oh. leaving something simple in the lunch box. And even early on, like my daughter was probably six or seven and we were doing early care at the time. And I got out and it's, we must've had sticky notes in the car because by the time I dropped him off and came back, there was a note on my steering wheel that either said you're doing a good job or maybe it was just something as simple as I love you. But it was, I feel like it was something more juicy than that because I remember saving it for a long time. And it was that I took a picture of it even so I could remember it, but it was my kids giving me an affirmation. So like these little things, like, I mean, and the irony in those little moments is it cracks out the thought that you're currently thinking about. You could be having the worst day. And when you walk through that door, your kids don't care. Like just remembering that when you walk through that hero's welcome at your door, they don't care what kind of day you had. They're going to reflect back who they see, which is always this massive man that's as bigger than life and realizing and being able to step into that and realizing that you are just as powerful in those thoughts as you're trying to instill in your daughter as well. Exactly. Well, let me just even springboard off of what you just said about the little things, big things. Like you might go, that was just a little tiny sticky note with, you know, 10 words on it. That little thing is a big thing. Here's the flip side of that. When you're at the end of your rope at the end of your day and you come home, as you just were talking about, Ben, maybe you don't get a hero's welcome. You get in and she doesn't look your way. She's crabby. She's a teenager. She's got emotions flip-flopping everywhere. And you take it personal, right? Going, this ain't no hero's welcome. I don't want to be here. And so you bite her head off, but it really has more to do with your day that filled your cup of intensity. And that was just one final straw, one drop in that bucket to put it over the edge. But one small negative reaction she slams the door and shuts you out the whole night. So remember, dad, nobody's perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be present. So I just want to highlight, make amends, humble yourself, go to her and own it, own it. Don't defend it. And when you really do humble yourself and come and say, you know what? That was my stuff. Will you forgive me? Don't just say, I'm sorry. You got to ask, will you forgive me? So that she says, yes, that's how you build the bridge back to her heart space. So that little thing, the anger can be a big thing to her, but then a seemingly little thing, like saying, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Is really a big thing in rebuilding or building a connection with your daughter. I'll give you a war story, only a week old. So last Monday, I had this great plan. The kids get off early an hour on Mondays and we we're going to go to the dog park. We we're going to walk the dog and we we're going to go for ice cream. And it was just getting warm, like 60 degrees, not like sh- pure shorts weather, but like at 62, they're asking for the sprinklers. So like in kids mind, it was warm and they wanted to come back home, which is maybe a seven or eight minute drive coming back home to change into shorts. And it was one of those dad moments where you have a 50 50 shot. This could be heaven or this could be hell. And you decide to either dig in or to lean in. Well, I decided to dig in. I'm like, no, it's not that hot. We're going to go to the dog park. And the whole car mounted down with emotions from my oldest daughter to the youngest. And everybody was just super mad at me. And then I, I blew up the whole trip. We didn't go anywhere. No ice cream, no dog park. We just went home. But that moment was solidified for my oldest. She was angry at me the rest of the night. Ah. And primarily from like, we've been having these conversations that she says in her words, I, you don't hear me, dad. You don't understand. And for me, as a person trying to understand this, and I've been talking to her at nighttime for bedtime talk for at least four years. So I've consistently at least been building this trusting relationship. She's 10 now. So you've been doing this since she was six. Yeah, Uh at least six. We've been every night. And she used to get off the bus and say like, hey, dad, we need bedtime talk. So like it was an invitation. Yeah. Like I was like really proud. But now we're in this moment where like, when I do like those moments, it's almost, and I can tell you some of the th- words she gives me is like, when you use your parent power to hold over something over me, or when you say that I need to do something that I don't want to do. And then there's a consequence, like that you're the consequence king, or like, you're always punishing me for things that you want me to do instead of not listening to what I want to do. And sometimes like, I struggle with this because sometimes from like a dad point of view or adult, like who you want to grow up to be, you're trying to season it with responsibility, with respect. Cause there's some moments like the way she talked to me in the car, it was very disrespectful. It was very yelling. It was very unappreciative of the entire experience. And then I got upset. I'm like, nobody showed any gratitude towards me trying to go to the dog park, get ice cream. Everybody was just upset about the shorts. And meanwhile, it created this entire problem that she was angry at me till at least nine o'clock that night over her shorts issue. So like 
what you're talking about is real life. And what I just explained is real life. So I'm wondering in that context of that pile of crap, what would you <laughs> suggest that like the part I always think in my head or the question is like, what is she looking to hear from me or what feeling? And you can maybe calibrate this where, I, but I'm always assuming like whatever she's saying, like the actual issues on the other side of the room. Like if she's standing at the door telling me exactly what's wrong, the real issue is in the back corner, 10 feet away. Exactly. And trying to get there is extremely exactly. difficult. Meanwhile, she's trying to attack me for something or make me the enemy in many cases, is what it seems like nowadays. Okay, so I totally hear you because we had a bunch of family here this weekend and one was a teenage boy and one was a teenage girl. And it was the whole same thing of lack of respect, a lot of what some of us as adults might call entitlement you know, and we're like, where's the gratitude? So I get that the humanity part of this is that, especially when you add in the military layer is respect, honor, responsibility, duty, right, is a really big virtue. And so when you think about the fact that when we as adults blow our stack, are we modeling to them the very virtues we want them to have? Probably not right? It's, well, neither of us now are in our best place. And it's so hard as the adult, especially as a dad, to lead with vulnerability, to soften your tone. I mean, you've, you've read my blogs long enough. Maybe you've even read my books where I talk over and over because I'm collectively giving you as dads what I've heard in over 40 years of walking alongside girls and young women, because I've mentored them, I've counseled them, I've loved on them. Some of them aren't professional, but they're just little girls and young women that I've loved on. And over and over, this is what I hear. And so I'm saying, dad, if your daughter can't say it, here's what I want you to hear. You have got to lead by softening your tone. So let's go back to your question, Ben. That's why I laughed. You're like, okay, if you were in the car with us, what would you, how would you have coached me? How would you have quote whispered to me as a dad? What would I, what could I do different next time? I hate shoulds, by the way. My dad uses a lot of shoulds and I'm like, dad, don't say that. I am a recovering shouldaholic. And I generally worked. try to have more uh, awareness oh. to them, but sometimes they do slip because it's a natural word that we apply right? to ourselves. Right. So I'm like, don't shit on yourself. Don't shit on your daughter, you know, because like, so this isn't saying you should have done it different because I love the fact that you're a dad that right now is modeling vulnerability, honesty, authenticity, right? Openness by saying, Hey, Michelle, what could I have done different? Dad, that is a great stance because you're not starting by saying I'm the dad. It's my way or the highway. But let me go back to what you said about, I love your insight. You are a wise man here. I'm glad you're leading this podcast because you, for you, you to say there's something else going on in the corner of the room, Ben, I don't hear most men, and this isn't a put down. It's just an observation. I don't hear most men even have that level of awareness. So here's my version of how I say it to my counseling clients. The thing you think is the thing isn't the thing. Now I would okay, say that's my said, golden rule when it comes to feelings is whatever okay, you're telling me or like selling it as I'm not buying it. <laughs> okay. That's really good. So the thing you think is the thing isn't the thing. So that might be a way you lead dad by saying to your daughter, Hey, I just heard this quote. The thing you think is the thing isn't the thing. Do you know what the thing is? And so what a lot of times you'll find is that a friend just dissed her in some way, or there was usually it's some, it could be some peer relationship. It could be something with her body image. Like she, for an older girl, I don't know if this is at 10 yet, but it depends on the girl. It can be at 10. Maybe she didn't fit into something that she fit into last summer. And it doesn't feel like a positive. It's like, I don't fit in any of my clothes. Well, you don't know that that's what she just went through before going to the dog park. So you said it was about the shorts. I'm like, dad, a lot of times it's that kind of thing. The outfit doesn't fit. It doesn't go together. It doesn't work. Her hair didn't work. I mean, one of them yesterday with our 14 year old granddaughter is I said, oh, did the curling iron that you forgot that I gave loan to you work? She said the outlet didn't work. Well, come to find out you have to push it. If you know how that, mm -hmm. if it, the breaker goes off but she didn't come and tell me. So then her hair didn't work. So then I find out, you know, that there was a blow up with her mom, but it probably went back to her hair and to the thing not working. So it had nothing to do with 
this, that, or the other. So I think, dad, the more you can remember, first of all, the thing you think is the thing, isn't the thing. Soften your tone, lead by example. So if you want her to learn honor, respect, your question you have to ask is, are you respecting her in this moment? Are you pulling rank? Because that's what a lot of dads do. I'm going to give you two three word questions that I learned from my friend, Mike. He's been in the ABBA project, the dad group that I lead. He does this as a businessman and it's golden. You say, tell me more. Why is that? So you're asking questions, which is why in my book, Let's Talk, Conversation Starters for Dads and Daughters, there's 60 different topics and themes that are all on different scenarios so that you can ask your daughter questions before you tell her what you think. So that, I mean, I know I'm throwing a lot out there. Dad, just take one of these ideas and run because it's this is a lot of info. But I would say another practical thing is ask a question before making a statement. So you may go, there is no gratitude in this car. It's we're done. If you guys don't change it up, you don't get to have, have a reward, so to speak, for this kind of attitude, right? Is instead of making a statement, ask a question first. Can you tell me why you're really upset? I want to go back to what you said about emotion, that a lot of men don't have that vocabulary. I've got a handout that I give to counseling clients that teaches a vocabulary of feelings. And at the top are five. So this is like getting out in the weeds, guys. This is just five primary emotions that may help give you a grid. Well, happy is the first one. So look at it. It's already easier. There's only four because you know, this ain't happy right now. It's angry, sad, scared, confused. Angry, sad, scared, confused. She's definitely feeling one of those four. And a lot of times, especially for men, those quote unquote, softer, more vulnerable, even, even seemingly weaker emotions come out through which funnel, the anger funnel. Well, same for your daughter. We all get frustrated, but the truth is a lot of times under the mad is sad. If you can get to the sad, guess what happens? The tears come out. Guess who's already soft and not angry anymore. So anyway, I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there, but it's ask questions, soften your tone, model, right? More's caught than taught. Model by example, what you want her, you know, to be doing, but I get the fact, I mean, give one more. You may laugh at this one, but I'm not kidding you. Stop the car, start walking around the car to cool yourself off first. Your kids are going to think you've lost your freaking brain. Like you're like, dad's gone bonkers. Well, part of it is you're, you're walking. So we call this bilateral stimulation. I'm not trying to get all psycho techie here, but it's right, left, one foot up, one foot up, one foot back, one foot up, you know, right here. When we walk, we're actually doing something that replicates what happens in REM sleep with rapid eye movement, where our eyes go back and forth. You can do it with your body and it helps calm your arousal system. So dad, can you imagine you're like, daddy's ready to blow. You know what? I mean, you know it. So you pull off and you start doing paces around the car where your kids are in there. They're not going to know what's happened, but you're going to say less things you regret if you can first calm your arousal system by doing a walk around. In fact, I tell men often, you know how we give kids time timeouts. Hey, you're three, you get a three minute timeout. You're five, you get a five minute timeout. Hey, if you're 40, you need a 40 minute timeout to cool your brain. So that's a real practical, that's even PTSD stuff that helps with guys that have right coming back from whatever branch of the military or whether they were combat or in another role, but right. I mean, we have PT, I have PTSD in my trauma history, by the way. So I have real understanding for what this is. Dad, another way that you can calm yourself down. One is to do right, left walking, pacing is to put one hand on your forehead and another hand on the back of your head where you can have that round part. And it's called a UFO hold, an unwinding frontal, that's the front part, occipital, that's the back part of your, of your eye sockets, their hold. It's not a funny word, UFO hold, but nobody, nobody forgets that, but it's an unwinding when you're wound up, frontal occipital hold. You could teach your daughter that. So here you are walking around the car, one hand on your forehead, one hand on the back of your head, 
calming your own arousal system, it's also going to help them in the car, calm, breathe, right? Get, get grounded more before you have a conversation. So I don't know. What do you think, Ben? I'm throwing a lot at, at, at your listeners because I want it to be practical and action oriented. My brain is going a thousand times a minute. And I want to add one thing about her school that I feel like has made this issue more magnified. So where she goes to school, they have fourth, fifth, and sixth together as a combined system. And so they're all the fourth graders together. And essentially, essentially the best way I can psychologically say it is the sixth graders have become eighth graders. And those that same type of bullying picking on now happens at the fourth grade level instead of the sixth grade. And what I'm learning is that girls are not ready to be sixth graders at fourth grade, and they're just now becoming socially aware. And the reason why I say that to set up this next question is because it creates a lot of big feelings and thoughts that they're bigger than I think what her age allows her to conceptually see. And it's those big feelings that she struggles to work through. And I've also, she'd been doing the calm meditation app for, I think she's on a streak of like 120 days now, because I've also like one of my primary things is I just want you to notice, like if I can get her to notice a certain thing or a certain feeling, I feel like that's a big win, but the feelings are so big. Sometimes I struggle with when do you hold the line and try to get control? Because I, I would say my default is I'm perfectly even being able to stay calm within a house that feels like it's burning down emotionally and laughing about it. Because like, really, is this what dadhood's supposed to be about? This was not on the brochure. Like, I'm really good <laughs> at just standing in the middle of chaos and not being reactionary. I've done a lot of inner work that you talk about in your book about calming down so you can grow up and be that adult. But how do you know when to hold the line and say like that behavior is not OK and it has a consequence? Because I don't want her to feel like these feelings are bad, but there's sometimes where the uncontrolled emotion may become destructive towards her siblings and where it's like being loud or disrespectful or sometimes just kind of wild in nature. And like, I don't know as a dad just to ride with it because sometimes I just let it go. And I know the irony in emotions is this is why like holding the line with young kids, I wish I would have let more go because it is a wave. If you ride the wave uh -huh. with them, it goes away. Like you could burn down the day for punishments and stack them. So that the entire day is horrible for something that could have lasted three minutes and they would have been back to being normal afterwards. Uh -huh. And looking back so much in the beginning, I realized that with my oldest, I didn't do that correctly. I've, I've corrected it with my youngest. So I see the difference in her behavior, but I still have these big feelings that she doesn't often allow herself to move through. And I don't know as a dad, how do you help her realize these big feelings are okay, but at the same time, no one to punish them and realize that's not an okay thing to do. Do you say that to her? Everything you said now about being self-aware and talk, do you, I'm guessing you talk to her about big feelings. I generally talk to her as an adult and I talk about in the language. Yeah. I don't try to water it down. I talk to her in from an understanding of like, I want her to grow to the thinking that I want her to think. So I don't try to water it down. I'm pretty direct depending on how, what goes on in bedtime talk. But in bed, I mean, I've had, we've had bedtime talk that lasted two hours where I'm talking about like how, the work that I've done, my stories, different things that have upset me and different things of where she's going and like meditation. And we've had really good discussions, but there's still these big feelings that boil up mm -hmm. from her day at school of maybe not having friends, not being accepted and being picked on, being considered weird. She's a crier. She's an, she's got my empath, empath ability to cry a lot. So any little thing she'll start crying over. And so then everybody looks at her weird. So they're just all these big feelings. And yes. Trying to realize and make her show respect to people that she can't talk to people that way, but realizing it's a big feeling. She just needs to process it. But at the same time, there's better, healthier ways, but she's only 10. So I often always, always season like I'm 37 and I barely have life figured out. How dare I judge a 10 year old for not having life figured out? But I don't know yeah, where the yeah. lines are and the barriers are like, where do you hold them to a 10 year old standard of expressing big feelings? Well, I think you answered some of it when you use the word destructive. Obviously, when there's a destructive response and you if there's a way as a dad, you can I know that's on a continuum, but you can categorize for yourself and your family standards and values what you would deem destructive. Because if she's having a meltdown over her outfit and she's in there yelling at herself, you might go, that's destructive at herself versus she lashed out at her younger sibling, which tends to happen more often than not. 
you go after the, you know, the least strong member of the family, right? And it comes out that way. But I think that that might be, right, a standard to go, dad, how destructive is this? Because if it's, if it's not maybe over a five on a zero to 10 scale, if you, but I get that it's subjective, but we got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. If you can ask yourself, where would I rank this? It will help you stay grounded because here's the thing. You've got one foot on the thinking track and one foot on the feeling track. So when you think inside your own brain about her feelings, it's helping you keep one foot on a thinking track. So you're not now following her lead. And now we're both having a completely only feeling overreactive. Moment. Now we're both riding the wave and we're both yes. making choices. We both have to apologize to later. Right. So if you can think and ask yourself, where would I put her this level of quote unquote destruction or lack of respect or that kind of thing, it may help you keep one foot on the the thinking track. There's another thing. If she's 10, maybe there's another just practical action step is give her 10 minutes and yourself 10 minutes and see what she's like in 10 minutes. Because you just said it well is she may be over it in three, not over it, but less destructive. I mean, it's amazing how like angry a kid or my son will often do it like, or I'll get it probably multiple times a week. Like, daddy, you're the worst. And even my 10 year old, like, daddy, you're the worst. And literally like 10 minutes later, they'll be wanting to play something with me. And it's, it's just, yeah. So use their age as kind of maybe the number of minutes to say, I'm going to wait to react or respond until that many minutes have gone on. If it's still there, then I'm going to go quote unquote, jump on it. You know, because you want to be a dad who leads. That's why in my book, I have lead her to laugh, lead her to love, lead her to look, lead her to lament, lead her to listen. That's where she listens to you about your stories. You hand her the book so she can ask you questions. But I think I want to say one more thing about what your daughter's going through. I mean, isn't it just absolutely heartbreaking that a daughter that you love, that I imagine you see as a world changer, as beautiful the way she is, is already being affected negatively by others that say, we don't like you. We're just going to pick on you because you're 10. Nothing personal, but she doesn't know that. It feels very personal to her. So then what happens way more than boys, girls change who they are to be accepted by their peers. A guy might say, Hey, you don't like me. I'm going to take it out on the field. You know, like I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to show you out there. And girls are over here going, if you don't like me, I'm never going to wear that outfit again. Cause you looked at me up up and down and you don't like it. You're the queen bee. And I mean, I actually, I've, I, I can think of one time I talked to, to um, fifth and sixth grade girls, all these like 60 of them sitting on the floor. And I literally got out two mirrors. One is broken that I've glued together. One is plain, same mirror. And I'm like, look at same you, same day. Look in this mirror. You look like you same you, same day. Look in this mirror. It's, it's all broken. So I'm like that girl that is doing that to you. She's a broken mirror. And I had them put one hand on their hip and flip their little finger up and go, broken mirror. I'm like, if you as a dad can help your daughter see that that's their stuff, you're really fighting. Let's use that combat word. You are fighting for your daughter not to lose herself. We live in a world where it's watered down, right? Like nobody knows what gender they are anymore. Nobody knows what, what style works because it's like, just go, you know, non-binary, go neutral. It's like right now that, I mean, I could go on and on with the hits and I'm telling you 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there was already a lot of hit against females, I believe. And I think we're going to have a healthier country from the ground up with healthier women. That's why I love championing dads. Your affirmation when she's been, beat up quote unquote all day. And she comes home and you add to that. You're not doing that right. You didn't respect your mom. You didn't clean the dishwasher out when I told you, but she's in maybe putting a fire out from the day that in that moment, her peers mattered more than getting that job done. And now she's getting double whammy. Does that make sense? Because women are so relational, their relationships when they're off, and you all know this, don't you? Think of any woman in your life, your mom, your sister, a uh, coworker, your, your daughter, your ex-spouse. We're not good when our relationships aren't good. Men are like, oh, well, you can't win them all. You, you go work out and you work it out. And we're over here falling apart. So remember how important your daughter's relationship is with you when her world is falling apart. So you can say, tell me more. Seems like you've had a hard day. 
seems like the shorts are kind of a 10 to you right now. Teach her the zero to 10 vocabulary. What number is this short tissue to right now? Dad, it's a 10. Can't you tell? And you're like, you're thinking in your head, you gotta be freaking kidding me. We got people in Ukraine dying right now. You're, you're melting down over a pair of shorts. They don't even have clothes. They had to run out the door. You know, you want to go into rational. But like you just said, how do you ride the wave? Ask her, what are you angry about? What are you sad about? What are you scared about? What are you confused about? Put those words on your phone. So you've got them right there. Asking questions. Here's the deal. When we as women open our mouth, our heart opens. When our heart is open, your heart is open, right? As a dad. But when we stop talking, it ain't good. When we shut the door and slam the door and go in and shut, we shut down when we shut you out. But if you can help facilitate talking more, we figure it out. Here's another practical way to ask questions. Use the keyword or the last word of the sentence. And then remember in school, who, what, when, where, why, how, you put those together. So you go, what about the shorts right now has you so angry? How are you not excited about the park? Help me understand. There's another one, another three word phrase. Help me understand because I'm not getting this right now. Dad, you gotta be kidding. You're so stupid. How can you not get it? You know, but she's getting it out and you're holding it. You were made, Dad, to hold intensity. You may think you weren't cut out to hold intense emotion. You're gonna grow in that. Like Ben is coaching you here. He's saying, I'm not doing it right, but I'm getting in there. I mean, I'm holding the bucket that... and I'm getting messy with whatever's coming out. Come on, good example. Yep. There you go. You actually gave me some validation in something that I often always lead by that in the early years, your daughters are testing you with the small things to know if you're going to be there for the big things. That are you going to be there to rescue me at a party that I don't feel safe at and I can call you? Well, they tested you when you were eight. If you weren't yeah. there, they remember that. So you gave me that, like you just mentioned, like they don't care about Ukraine, but their world is life ending. It's just as big as me losing my job. Whatever they're going through is just as big. And if you discredit there, this is essentially a precursor to rebellious teenagers where they don't trust you to solve their problems. And you don't know that they're nuking on the inside and you don't even know what's happening until she comes home and says she's pregnant. And you're like, how did we get here? Well, <laughs> right. over these 10 years, you weren't there for all these sequential things. You also reminded me that in those times of the the feelings and the thoughts and even just the the outside world, it's just, I've had this recent thought that like, especially with the stuff she brings home from school, like there's already like kids swearing in the bus. We haven't had too much like sex conversations happen on the bus yet, but there's swearing, there's bullying, and it's uh -huh. just a very destructive behavior like we've talked about. And it made me realize like, why do parents focus so much on making the inside of their home a way that has to be perfect or even seem cruel and unusual when the outside world already does it to an nth degree? Like, why yeah. not make the home the safe place where you can melt down, you can be expressive, you can be angry and still be okay, and just let the outside world do what it does best to sharpen the edges, to make people have all these issues, to go through life in a very resistive type way but know that the feeling of home is safety. And when we, anytime you're a hard nosed dad, especially for military dads, if you go in there with your command and control mindset, you are creating an environment where she doesn't feel safe and she doesn't feel safe. She's not going to be understood. And the scene, the scene heard and understood, like that's the fundamental foundation, like all three, th those words. And so you just gave me kind of permission to pull back a little bit and error on that like it doesn't matter so much what happens here and she, in school she's a perfect her teachers love her she's the kind of person that i want her to be and to me i always measure like if it's not perfect here i'm not really as worried if it the results are happening out there and i just want to make sure that she understands that i'm safe and regulating that boundary over the 18 year span that you have in her life to me that's like the front lines of life but that's also yeah. where you are truly giving her the reflection and i often shortcut it for to say that like if she turns 18 and she knows that her value isn't determined by likes on Instagram, I've won. Like to me, that's yes. the fun, that's the bare minimum. But like, cause then she knows where to get love and she knows where to feel it on the inside, that it's not something externally. And you probably already see this over and over. Women are wired to seek that feeling from externally, primarily early on from our fathers. And if it's not there, they continue to seek it in all these unhealthy ways. Yep. And as fathers, 
you call us to lead this invitation to be this reflection for our daughter so that she can perpetually create these feelings all on her own without the outside world needing to validate it, which then creates a healthier marriage, health, creates healthier relationships, and creates healthier adults and stronger women, which is what we need more of. Yes! Oh my goodness, Ben. Everything you just said right now could literally take everything you just said <laughs> and, and literally that, that's your soundbite. Because I can I quote you? I want yes. to make a graphic and put this out there on my social media sites. Here's what you said. Your girls are testing you in the small things to see if you'll be there in the big things. Ben Kalora, right there. That, that's my quote. Your other one was, let's make home a safe place to melt down. That is so good. That, and it's the I opposite of standard parenting. like, Or yes, it's the same it opposite of like the 50s and 60s mindset where you need this command to control that you can't be expressive with your feelings. And the more I see like the outside world in school teach them all these negative narrations of their thoughts, like why would I reinforce that here? If they're okay, already me, doing it better than I could ever do it. Exactly. Okay. Let me give another kind of highlight, kind of a metaphor. Think of any, or an example, any job you've ever had, even let's go back to military. When you think about some of your you know, commanding officers, which ones did you respect the most? Which ones did you trust the most? Which ones did you work the hardest for? Well, how would you answer that, Ben? The ones who made me feel the safest, the ones that I could bring when I needed help, the ones when I was feeling the worst and the best, and that they would give me the same reaction from both. Okay, so in other words, there was a relationship foundation. Correct. It wasn't just about the job, getting the task done right. It was about the foundation of relationship, which again, I'm not just trying to pump my book, but the second one, because the first one is dad, here's what I really need from you, a guide for connecting with your daughter's heart. So that one was more helping dads understand daughters. The second one, let's talk, right? Conversation starters for dads and daughters. My goal is for a dad to lead conversations instead of saying, here, go to the coach, go to the mentor, go to the pastor, go to the counselor, you know, and no, no, no. I want you to lead these conversations. And then if they bomb, blame me and I'm, I'm your fall guy. But at the end of the day, I say, I've discovered that men would rather do nothing than do it wrong. Correct. Because the fear of failure and even in the military, yeah. it's even even worse. But to me, like I have that initial mindset, but I struggle and realize that like every conversation I'm learning about something. And you also gave me a mindset that I'm now going to employ in bedtime talk more that it's almost like you're building a PC bo C PCB board that runs your computer. There's thousands of circuits on that thing. Yeah. They all have to be established and soldered and built. And every one of these conversations that you're talking about builds a neuro circuitry in her mind yes. to walk the yellow brick roads that she needs on her own without you being there as an adult. And it's usually like when, when kids and adults mess up the most, it's because they navigate into a part of the board that doesn't have any circuits and it's short circuits and, and then they go. have to figure it out. Oh, that is fantastic. And so back to this thing is, okay, men would rather do nothing than do it wrong, but you get that doing nothing is doing it wrong. So even if you navigate into the part of the circuitry that there, there doesn't seem to be much developed there or wired in place there, or even outlets to be able to have some look there, you can develop that part of her brain by conversations mm -hmm. with you. So that's why let's say on the bullying, there's one of the questionnaires you can let your daughter pick out of the front of them. If you're a dad that goes, I don't even know what to say. Well, I don't even know what to ask. Well, guess what I have them there. It's on bullying and cyberbullying, where you can ask her, what have you noticed? What have you observed? What have you heard? What is what's happening inside you? Have you ever stood up, stood alone? That kind of thing. I mean, I remember one time being at a men's conference. I love speaking at men's conferences where there's a guy standing there who had won a purple heart. He's got a, his whole right arm is metal. You know, he didn't cover it up and hide it. And he goes, I was raised in an orphanage. You can tell, you know, right. I I'm, a victim, or I don't think he used that word, but you know, I've survived war. And when I came back, I can't connect with my daughter at all. And I never had that foundation. What do I do? And I'm like, here's this resource because I want your daughter is going to thrive. The research shows that every, every area of your daughter's life will be better with a feeling of connection to you. So back to what you said about, if you feel like there's a a positive relationship with your superior. You're going to work harder. You're going to trust more. You're going to open up more. So as a dad, 
Your daughter, if she feels connected to you, it means there's got to be a heart connection, right? And I said, that means her mouth is opening. She's going to get better grades in school, more likely to finish high school and attend college. She will have steadier employment with a feeling of connection to you, less depression and anxiety, healthier weight, less body dissatisfaction, lower suicide rates. She delays her sexual debut and on it goes. Can you believe Ben? That's all because of a feeling of connection to you as a dad. And I don't think you as men hear that enough. And so in case you celebrated enough are getting, yeah, if you're getting beat up right now in this season, Ben and I are here to say you matter, your presence matters, not your perfection. And as you grow in learning how to connect with your daughter's heart, you are going to thrive more by engaging yours. And I was thinking about my circuit board analogy and you would have loved this on the end of it is the adding a fuse to it, that your conversations with her are, are you're a fuse. So if it does short circuit, you fuse and the fuse breaks the conversation and you create that safe space. And so just to put that yeah. whole con- our whole conversation, like the connection, that relationship, the flow of energy between like, that's the fundamental, it's not perfect, but it's so important. Well, Michelle, I really appreciate your con- your time today. And I know we could talk forever, but man, <laughs> this conversation hit me right in the gut and in the heart and the head. And so I'm really excited for my daughter to come home and for us to reconnect and start trying some of these different things that you've taught me today. Oh, I've loved being here. It's been so awesome to connect with you. And I love your vulnerability, Ben, your depth of wisdom, and these guys that you are leading in the military dad podcast are really being led. And I'm not saying this to just, you know, blow smoke. I'm really telling you from my heart to yours, well done. You're leading by example. And these guys that are listening and women too, right. Are, are, I'm sure being encouraged by your leadership. So well done. I always say I'm an oxymoron as a Marine who talks about his emotions. I am known as giving good hugs and I do it openly on a podcast weekly. And it's, <laughs> yeah, being a Marine is like, it's just a sliding slope of being an oxymoron. Well, Michelle, thank you again for your time today. And I look forward to the next time we get to talk. Thank you. Loved being here. All right. So I hope that that episode nailed you right in the heart where you needed it. I hope that it gave you the inspiration to dive into courageous conversations with your daughter, even ones that may seem heated, even more than ones that just seem impossible. Even the big takeaway for this one, the the, the significance of how simple it is when you rephrase your question as I'm wondering That is my big takeaway because it's the simplest ones that often open up the biggest breakthroughs. And in any conversation with a woman, you have to know how you start the sentence is also going to determine how it's going to end. And so having the right starter can change completely how it's going to end. So with this question, I'm wondering, I've already tried out with my daughter. You can actually rapid fire. I am wondering, and it's this curiosity, like ability to ask questions and understand something And it doesn't necessarily trigger any stories. It doesn't trigger any emotions. It's just, I'm wondering why, blah, 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 blah. And it's already getting movement in some of the issues that I talked about. It's already giving me visibility to different things going on. So not a long-winded big takeaway, but I want you to highlight out of all the interviews that I've done, all the information that I've read, I'm wondering is something that I haven't come across, but it's already moving the needle and creating better conversations, getting better down to the the, bore, the the bones of an emotion and helping understand how we can get to a better place so we can get moved through it. Cause that's the point of an emotion. It's not meant to be stuck. It's meant to be moved through. And as a dad, we are that person that helps, but in this case, it's not always easy as most dads out there with daughters know. So guys, that is all I have for you. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the shit out of this episode because this episode needs to get into dads with daughters, hands and ears because this information is golden. The crisis for dads and daughters has never been greater. The emotional repercussions of what we're facing as dads with daughters has never been greater. And so getting this information into the dad's hands who know they need to change it, who know they want to do better, but don't really know how. So if you got value out of this, I ask, pay the fee, go ahead and share this with a friend who needs this message. Guys, that is all I have for you today. That is wrapping up for another week here on Military Veteran Dad. Don't forget there is a Business of Fatherhood podcast where I am dropping information, five minute advice, five days a week. So Business of Fatherhood is the name. It's on all the podcast players that you're. this podcast is on. So wherever you're listening to this one, 
go over and look for the business of fatherhood. And then I'll be in your ears five days a week, dropping nuggets, even from these, all these little things. I'm often rapid firing just what's going on in my life. What am I thinking about? And so there's over 280 episodes out there to binge. So lots of good stuff, lots of good tidbits that are coming out of these episodes. So an amazing week. And we'll be back again to do it all over next week. 